It is often perceived that the Sultan's harem was a paradise meant for men filled with half-naked beauties, luxury, exquisite food, and pleasant music. However, today we will look at the life in an eastern harem from a different perspective. We will begin by exploring the basics of how the Sultan's harem was formed and replenished. Parents often gave their young girls to the harem, mostly from poor families, as it was a highly coveted and prestigious job. Surprisingly, the harem was not a golden cage for slaves, but instead, a job for most of the women who lived there. They received a salary, kind of social package, took competency exams, and underwent interviews and studies, similar to a professional work environment in an office. It is a common myth that girls in the harem spend their days lounging in silks and sleeping until noon, but that couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, most women in the harem wake up at sunrise, embarking on a busy day ahead. Their day commences with a bath and makeup, followed by mandatory morning prayer and study time. The young girls in the harem attend a specialized school, similar to an English school for girls or a convent. The duration of their studies depends on their age and spans throughout their teenage years. They undergo approximately six to seven hours of study, six days a week, with an additional hour given for homework. Their studies are comprehensive, encompassing everything from the Quran, the art of conversation, court etiquette, calligraphy, handicrafts, and even the art of seduction. It is a hectic routine, and these girls have little to no leisure time, with their education being their only priority. In the context of the harem, a girl's education played a crucial role in her social status and personal success. With over 300 women in the court of Bukhara Emir and more than a thousand in the winter harem of Topkapi, attracting the sultan's attention was no easy feat. As such, concubines were expected to be intelligent and well-educated companions with knowledge in various fields. Their education wasn't solely focused on intellectual pursuits alone, as they were taught the art of seduction and pleasing a man to an expert level. Girls were trained to be professional seductresses regardless of their initial character traits, whether modest or quiet. Moreover, they had to have an in-depth understanding of the sultan's preferences, such as how he liked his rose water poured and the type of music he enjoyed. The ability to write poetry and sing was highly valued as well. Passing the school leaving exam, which was taken by the sultan's mother, was the ultimate test of their education. Failure meant no retake, and if a girl failed the final test, she was relegated to dishwashing and a luxurious life would no longer be within sight. After undergoing years of rigorous education, the girls who passed the sultan's mother's exam became potential concubines, but not every girl in the harem was prepared for such a role. Although they lived secluded lives, most girls were engaged in regular daily work, such as cleaning, laundry, and kitchen assistance. For their services, they were paid six silver coins, which was equivalent to about 18 USD per day. Despite their pay, the ordinary harem dwellers lived in modest conditions, sharing communal facilities, and residing in small rooms. The rooms were primarily designed for sleeping, with limited space for personal belongings. Only the favored few were selected for the luxurious life of a concubine, with the vast majority continuing to live the same mundane life with minimal prospects of ever rising in rank within the harem hierarchy. Within the harem, a rigid hierarchy existed among the women. At the bottom were the jury, ordinary girls who had just arrived and were relegated to the mundane work. Due to the high competition and limited opportunities, most remained in this rank until they aged out or were released from the harem. However, a successful jury could become an usta, already an accomplished beauty who could spend the night in the sultan's chambers if chosen. Many women dreamed of bearing the sultan's child, as it would automatically elevate them to a higher rank in the hierarchy. Those who gained access to the sultan's chambers no longer had to engage in menial work and enjoyed a more pleasurable life. However, the competition for the sultan's favor was fierce, and women would go to great lengths to achieve their desired goal, using all sorts of tricks to get ahead. While some aspired to become the sultan's new favorite, others aspired to become his wife. Nonetheless, no matter the rank or ambition, tension and competition were constant among the women in the harem. There were also girls in the harem whose duties did not involve interacting with the sultan. These girls were assigned to serve the noble women of the harem such as the sultan's wives, daughters, and mother. Serving the noble women was considered the most prestigious job, as it allowed the girls to be in close proximity to the most powerful figures in the harem. In particular, serving the sultan's mother, known as Walid, was the most desirable position, as she was the foremost authority in the harem and oversaw all its administration. 
Girls who served Walide had a higher chance of advancing in the ranks of the harem hierarchy, as their proximity to her allowed for greater influence and access to more opportunities. Thus, competition for this position was intense, and it was an honor coveted by many of the girls in the harem. Contrary to popular belief, only the most beautiful girls were not guaranteed entry into the harem. In addition to external beauty, the girls had to undergo rigorous testing. The tests evaluated their intelligence, personality, and social skills, making it clear that being beautiful did not guarantee selection. The ideal figure ratio was also crucial and particular attention was paid to characteristics such as hair color and skin condition. The ratio between the waist and hips was believed to be 2 to 3, a standard that was universally accepted across the Arabian world. Interestingly, there are some historical photos that depict women with mustaches in the harem of the Iranian Shah Nasser al-Din, which has led people to question the beauty standards of the time. However, in fact, these photos are of men dressed in women's clothing actors of the court theater. During those times, women were forbidden from acting in the theater, and so male actors played both male and female roles. Thus, these pictures do not accurately depict the beauty standards of the harem, and it is crucial to approach historical records with critical thinking and context in mind. One common misconception about the girls in the harem is that they constantly walked around half-naked, wearing transparent silk dresses or no clothes at all. This image of the harem was popularized by European artists in the 19th century, who depicted the sultan's concubines or odalisks in a very explicit way. However, most of these artists had never been inside a harem, where they would not be allowed, nor had they ever been in the Ottoman Empire. It is essential to understand that a woman from the Muslim world was obliged to present herself with modesty. There is a widespread misconception that all women in the harem were slaves. However, this is not entirely accurate. While the girls within the harem were indeed tied to it, it is essential to understand that women, in general, had limited rights during that time globally. Women were often dependent on male relatives, such as their parents or husband, for their livelihood. This was prevalent in many societies around the globe, including England, where women's rights were limited until the 20th century. It is important to highlight that while there were slaves in the harem who served the sultan and his inner circle, as well as wives and mistresses, not all women in the harem were slaves. The remaining women in the harem had the freedom to leave the walls and engage in various activities, such as visiting the Oriental Bazaar and going boating. Moreover, they could even take vacations if they needed to improve their health. One common myth about the harem was that once a girl entered it, there was no way out. However, this is far from the truth. In the harem, many girls were candidates for the sultan's attention. If a girl did not receive any signs of interest from the sultan for nine years, she was free to leave the harem. In such circumstances, the sultan's treasury provided the girl with a dowry, and she was even helped to find a suitable husband. Girls who proved themselves well in the harem were even offered the opportunity to purchase a house and provided with regular payments. These girls were in high demand as they were the most beautiful, intelligent, educated, and had good dairies by the standards of their time. Many of them found happiness as they were often taken as wives by court nobles. It is important to note that while the harem was a foreign concept to Western society, it was not necessarily a place of oppression. The girls in the harem had opportunities to leave, find husbands, and live a fulfilling life. This form of society had its particular customs, and the girls accepted them as norms. However, it would be inappropriate to say that they were unhappy because many found happiness within their roles in the harem. The life in the sultan's harem has been widely viewed as oppressive and restrictive of women's rights and freedom. However, it is important to acknowledge that during that time, living in a harem was the norm for many countries and societies. Harems were not exclusive to sultans, but also existed in ancient China under the emperors, among the Egyptian pharaohs, and even among European kings who had their court ladies and favorites. It is essential to understand that the lifestyle in the harem was a product of the previous century's social and cultural norms, such as the patriarchal hierarchy. Although harems have been portrayed negatively in modern times, it is crucial not to judge them harshly, but to view them through the cultural and historical context of the time. Well, if you find this story interesting, subscribe to the channel and stay in touch.